So we are live now. So I'm just going to share today's program on the screen of the YouTube channel. It's a full program. Two o'clock, sir. Sir, uh, I request Professor Armugam, sir, to give an introduction. Yeah. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone. I am Dr. Armugam. I am the president of uh, Indian Association of uh, Sports Medicine. On the behalf of uh, IASM, uh, I take a great pleasure in inviting you to this series of webinars. And these uh, webinars are uh, being conducted in collaboration with the uh, Malaysian Association of Sports Medicine with the affiliation to Asian Federation of Sports Medicine. I take this opportunity and thank all the faculties who have uh, taken off time from the busy schedule and uh, shared their experience among this difficult time of uh, COVID. And uh, I, um, we today are going to be uh, talk on exercise science. We have a series of webinars, each day focused on one particular aspect of uh, sports science. Today is the exercise science, a very uh, integral part, very important part for a sports scientist or sports medicine, not only for the high-end athlete, also for common people. Now awareness of fitness has gone tremendously high in the, this part of the world. And I'm sure uh, a lot of our delegates will have many questions on day-to-day -day problems. I hope uh, today's uh, topics will cover that. We have experts from uh, Malaysia and uh, Thailand to cover the important topics on sports science, and it will be moderated by Professor Megan and uh, Andrew from South Africa. So without taking any much of time, I request the first speaker to uh, take the lecture. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So over to Professor Megan and uh, Andrew Gray to host the session today. So for Andrew, I will, I'll start first, yeah? Okay. Okay, thank you everyone. And uh, uh, very good afternoon to all of you, for the viewers. This is our, as Prof. Aru mentioned, this is the fourth uh, webinar, that international webinar that on exercise science organized by the Indian Association of Sport Medicine, Malaysian Association of Sport Medicine, and together with the uh, Center for Sports and also Faculty of Sports Science uh, of University Technology Mara Malaysia. That uh, we have uh, very uh, four speakers from uh, Thailand to Malaysia and uh, very prominent scientists in their own area and practitioners in the medical field. They're going to be presenting to us. We will start with the first speaker, Professor Rung Chai, uh, very good friend of mine. And I must say that uh, I've learned a lot of things from him in many ways. Uh, he is the expert in the uh, uh, exercise physiology, um, how to put it in a way, uh, very uh, extensive person in the work of the research in the exercise physiology and very got a very experience in the altitude training. Uh, he's now attached to uh, College of Sports Science and Technology, Mahidol University in uh, Thailand. Um, he will give us a talk on the altitude training and performance issues and challenges. I think this is a very interesting area to explore. Let us listen to uh, Professor uh, Dr. Rung Chai uh, for his uh, uh, topics on the altitude training. Prof. Rung Chai, is yours? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity for me to join with this webinar. Um, and this is my topic. Okay, I just go uh, a bit. 
uh, faster in some unnecessary slide. Okay, this is the beginning of uh, the study people around the world pay attention on. It started in 1968 in Me Mexico City because most of the athletes, they collapse and they need oxygen supply. Okay, however, in um, power sports, for example, in long jump, short put, vertical jump, something, they all broke the records. But the distant runner, the marathon runner, marathon swimmer, distance swimmer, they got disadvantages of this. And one of the uh, American uh, uh, writers said that if you prepare everything in an appropriate way, you can cope with the condition uh, on Mexico City. And this is something that's happened. People who joined with uh, Mexico Olympic from Kenya, from Ethiopia, and to, from Tunisia, they haven't got the problem. The marathon runner from those countries, they got their medals. Why? Because they had trained in their hometown within the same altitude. Uh, and intentionally, they didn't know that it's gonna offer them some kind of the, the good benefit. Okay, now what we are going to cope when we climb up to the top of the mountain, uh, one is the low, lower atmospheric pressure. Second is the air density less up there. It's cold and it's got some kind of the big radiation. That's why we get skin burn when we got into the top of the mountain. It, uh, in, uh, in spite of the cold temperature. And one Italian uh, scientist in 2008, he said, uh, the reduction in the athletic performance depends on uh, the height you descend, how fast, how long you expose to the, the altitude, and what the intensity of your physical activity you are going to do, how fast, how far at a time be, uh, before you uh, uh, take a break. And um, uh, this, this slide may hit you on the head, <laughs> but I try to go it in a simple way. This is uh, what happened to uh, the oxygen gas from the inspire, from the environment to get into our, our cells, to the target cells, to the muscle cells during the physical activity of climbing up to the mountain. Uh, first, uh, you have to look at the bottom line from the inspire. We have uh, 760 millimeter, millimeter mercury of uh, atmospheric pressure, right? And according to the law of partial pressure, you just multiply by 20% and you got about 152 millimeter mercury from your inspire at your nose. When you get into the lungs, into your air sac, your alveoli, uh, you have to subtract about 47 millimeter mercury of the vapor pressure at 37 Celsius in the lungs. So the, the, the partial pressure of oxygen in the lung diminished to just about 100. With a complete, a complete diffusion, it's got into your uh, capillaries in the lung and it's got about 100 millimeter mercury pressure as well. When it's go to the, um, the, the, the target organ, the muscle cells. Muscle cells extract oxygen, utilize, and push it back into a venous blood. And the pressure there is about 40 millimeter mercury. So you can see from this uh, bottom line that anything that's affect your inspired air gonna affect your oxygen consumption in your working muscle. And let's come to this, this slide on the, pot, uh, on, on the, the top figure. Uh, I just want to say that uh, there are two phenomenon happen when oxygen pass into our blood. First is the dissolve. The dissolving of oxygen is uh, depends on many factor, the solubility or something. Okay, so the dissolved form of oxygen dictate the bile form. The bile form is the oxygen that attached to hemoglobin. So the bile form dictate our performance and it's come to our hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve, okay? We normally work from point A to point B. Point A is the artery, point B is the vein, all right? So it just go back 
from A to B and B to A at the lung, something like that. But however, for some instant, if you got lower is by A, it's not going to be at point A anymore. It's going to be A1, something, for example. And, uh, and for some time, uh, our blood will dissociate oxygen to the cells. Or we can say in the other way that our muscle cells can extract more and more oxygen. For example, it go back to point C, which is the steepest part of uh, the, the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve. That means we can get more air. However, we cannot go further down than that because of the next slide. Okay. If you look at this, I just bring you up to the mouth of Everest. You should understand that we have the same percentage of oxygen and nitrogen gas on every part of the world, but they got a different density. So if you calculate for departure pressure at sea level, you may got 152 millimeter mercury. If you go to the Mount Everest, which is about nine kilometers from the sea level, and the, the pressure there is just 230, when you multiply by 20%, we just got uh, 46 millimeter mercury, which is almost the same as the blood. And if you subtract for 47, you got number of this of zero in our alveoli. That means that means you cannot get any molecule of oxygen into your capillary. On the other hand, you may lose your oxygen from capillary to the environment, and that's why that's why the millionaire. They want to uh, go to Mount Everest. They can hire a, a, a helicopter. They can get there in 15 minutes, but they're going to they're gonna got the problem of acute, a serious condition of acute mountain sickness. Okay, so if you look at the air pressure, at the air pressure at different altitudes from 2,000 to uh, 5,000, you realize when I highlight in here that at 4,000 million uh, meters above sea level, your uh, partial pressure of oxygen in alveoli is just 43. That is enough. That, that is not enough to survive. And this comes to our concern in exercise physiology because there, are, there were two Olympic events. Mm -hmm hosted by two countries, one by Mexico in 1968, the other one by Brazil, just the last time, right? So this comes to our concern that how we can overcome the problem. And this slide, I show you uh, a Sherpa, a native Highlander in, uh, in Nepal. Mm -hmm. They have an extraordinary performance. They can carry things up to the top of the mountain easily because of what? the genetics change physiological uh, 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 adaptation to altitude from century to century is it's adapt something for the better response. They can trap oxygen even oxygen is really low in uh, on top of the mountain. And most of them, they live at 3,500 meters above sea level. Okay, uh, I just jump over this one and just look at this. How about in, in Asian country? I just explore from the internet. Okay, uh, where can we do the test? Where can we do the simulation of altitude training? Okay, we have somewhere in Cambodia, even in Thailand, in, uh, in Laos, in Vietnam, uh, in Malaysia. I don't know, this is called Mount Kinabalu, I'm, I don't know I spell it correct or not. And the other place is in, in Kunming in China. Uh, all these places, um, they got the air pressure which is still appropriate for the body for the gas exchange. Above than that, we haven't got chance to do, right? Okay, now, the barrier of the real altitude training is the expense. It costs a lot, and you have to take about four, five weeks up there to train. And the problem comes with the acute mountain sickness. They may got 
appetite suppression, they may got um, dehydration, vomit or something. Okay. And the point is that the, the expense is very high. This is from my research uh, when I visited Colorado's uh, camp in, in, unit in Denver. It costs about over than 3,000 US dollars per week. If you go to Kenya, even, even higher because they plus so many things for you about over than 4,600. And uh, for the bottom line, 200,000 US dollars per month per team of swimmer, the Thai national swimmer, we ever went to Kunming in China for this kind of training. They charge us, they charge us for accommodation, local transportation, food, everything. And it costs a lot okay, to, 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 uh, to train in the real situation. So we have to think. I just tell you the story of living and training on top of the altitude. The other way is to do the altitude simulation. There are different ways. The first one they use what's called the high pole ventilation. They, you, just, you just ask the athlete to stop, to hold their breath. Okay, occasionally during training, that's to train the body to get less oxygen during training. The other one is from altitude 10, which has got some kind of disadvantages. For intermittent hypoxic training, they got to use some kind of uh, what's called the oxygen extractor, or they sometimes add more percentage of nitrogen into this equipment. The other one is the altitude simulation. Okay, they set the room to simulate the altitude. Okay, and there are four types of chamber. You got to understand one is the normal barrack hypoxic chamber under normal atmospheric pressure with low oxygen. The other one is normal barrack hyperoxic, okay, with high oxygen uh, concentration or pressure. The other one is hypobaric hypoxic and hyperbaric hyperoxic. They use these in the different uh, purposes, some for medical purpose, some for just uh, sport size purpose. Okay. Um, about three or four countries, they did not think about the altitude room. They think about the altitude apartment. That's correct. I'm talking something to you that they construct the building in a closed system with sealed off from every point of the building and induce some kind of low concentration of oxygen. Okay, and then just let the athlete stay there, train inside, so you can imagine how much is cost for this. And the place is in Finland, in uh, AIS Australia, the city of sport in Australia, Kalolinska in Sweden, and the other one is in Ireland. So all these places were constructed in order to cope with uh, 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 the, the athletic training when they have to travel overseas to somewhere which is in a very high uh, altitude condition. Okay, look at this slide. I'm talking about somebody on top of the mountain. This slide show you somebody who work under the ground, the miners, what happened to them? They are under the uh, uh, high pressure, right? And if you plug you just plug in the stop clock. The system gonna be the hyperbaric hypoxic immediately, right? Because they got to consume oxygen, right? Though the, the number of oxygen molecule become less and less, but the number of carbon dioxide being produced from their body become more and more. So they are under condition of two stimuli altogether, lower oxygen and higher carbon dioxide, right? Uh, the hypercapnic and hypocapnic condition. Okay. And if you look at this, these pictures, this is the cave from the movie. It's based on the true story of the 13 uh, soccer, young soccer team in Thailand who was trapped in the cave, right? Okay. Um, you just think about when flooding water just blocked them inside. So it's become the closed chamber. 
the more amount of water, flooding water, gonna induce some kind of higher pressure inside, right? With lower oxygen. So the condition at the beginning is the hyperbaric, hypoxic condition. And this come to the hands of the medical doctor from Australia when he, he, he was a leader for, to rescue these people. Uh, the first, he insert a big tube a big tube into the cave and push high amount of oxygen for them. So the condition inside the cave turns from hyperbaric hypoxia into hyperbaric hyperoxia immediately, right? And because these 13 kids, they were under the high pressure condition, you can imagine that they will develop a tiny, uh, most of the tiny bubbles in the blood and that's caused the trouble. You cannot rescue them immediately from inside the cave to the outlet of the cave. So they have to give them the, give them the trans, transferizer and try to brought them step by step from the innermost to the outermost side. And that's the medical issue. Just only the medical doctor can think about this. Okay, not, not other people. And that's a true story that happened and this is the lesson learned from them. Okay, therefore, if you ask me, how can we train in a simulated condition? Therefore, conventional altitude training, lift low, train low, lift low, train high, lift high, train low, and lift high, train high. I did try these experiment all together, okay, and we published a paper, the first paper in the bi biomedical research, this is the in fact, it's the acute condition, but I'm gonna tell you the story, the story of the chronic training. Uh, I spent six weeks with them. The first week, we just investigate everything from the resting condition, and we put them in a four week training of the four condition in a randomized fashion, okay? And we follow for an, by another week after training. We are lucky because, uh, when, when many, many years ago, when we realized that we have to go to Brazil for Olympic Games, we searched for the altitude in Brazil. And some city is 1,200 meters, some city 1,600 something, depends. So we prepare for our athletes for the altitude training. So the government construct the altitude chamber for us at the National Training Center, where we can uh, uh, mobilize the percentage of oxygen uh, lower than 12%. But anyway, for safety reason, we just keep it for 15%, which is identical to about almost 3000 meters above sea level. And this, these are the result, the un unpublished result. We compare, we, we keep them, we train them for four weeks. Then we bring them back and exercise them under normoxic condition and hypoxic condition. Okay, that means they train, uh, after successfully train, we bring them back to sea level and bring them back to top of the mountain and, and do the exercise test. So what we found is that the uh, leave high, train low, uh, they all got the improvement of the time to exhaustion, but it seemed to me the Leaf high train low is quite interesting. Okay, and this is a red, red blood cell. We have red blood cell, we have reticulocyte, we have everything. And we, we learn from this uh, figure that our, uh, if erythropoietin really uh, uh, stimulated, be stimulated from hypoxic training, it's appear the effect in just the first or the second week of the training period. So there's no need to stay there for four weeks. In fact, one or two weeks, that's enough. Okay, just go uh, further. Uh, I explore in the uh, cardio, cardiac function for the stroke volume and cardiac output as well, uh, using what's we called the cardiac impedance cardiography. Okay, so we can estimate for stroke volume and the uh, cardiac output. Uh, the result, okay, is increased not increase or decline, no matter. But 
if you look at uh, this this column again leaf height train low give us the good result with save about half of the expense compared to the leaf high train high leaf high train high you have to sustain them on top of the mountain condition uh, throughout the day but for leaf high train low you you just keep them you just lock them in the room at night and let them out and do some training with their coach during the day okay that's easy the other one this is the uh, the gas we use the uh, gas analyzer to uh, try to investigate what's the metabolic change for them and we again we find that leaf high train low is a good condition so i suggest if you want to repeat this kind of test you don't have to put money as i did but you just go to the leaf high train low condition right and most of the study give us the uh, positive result on that okay uh, unfortunately they, they identify leaf high train high is better than our leaf high train low <laughs> okay so it depends on the intensity and what kind of uh, 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 testing you do okay um, on the final I, I would like to summarize that uh, the altitude training give us the additional physiological stress okay in attempt to get better response okay so there's still the debate okay between scientists and scientists scientists and coach okay is a time consuming right and the one one thing one thing uh, dr mahendran i would like to uh, 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 let you aware about the responders and non responder it's about 50 and 50 percent it doesn't mean I got 33 soccer player and everyone respond to the altitude training, just half of them, just half. So we named them, uh, them, named them the fragile athletes and we have to, uh, to, to exclude them for the, from the study. Okay, this is, again, it's about 53 years since one New Zealand guy can go to top of the Everest with um, the, uh, the one Sherpa. And you know, from the history, it took them two days for the last 0 0.5 kilometer distance. And this is uh, from the Japanese. You may wondering why the Japanese, they got so many people who, who can go to top of Mount Everest. This is their, their secret. They, pe they pack up with oxygen in a can and they can breathe oxygen on top of the mountain. And that's the point. That is some kind of a very brilliant technology. Okay, uh, this is my last slide. Okay, I just would like to ask everyone to join us for the Pre-Olympic International Conference for Adaptation and Nutrition in Sport because I can. The first I can uh, was hosted by me in uh, near Pattaya last two years. And the next I can gonna be in Taiwan. Okay, you can uh, contact my friend, okay. Professor Gua. Thank you very much. That's the end. Thank you, Prof. Rung Chai. Very interesting uh, topic and the issues. In the end, we say train, train and uh, live high and train low, right? Yes. Yeah. That's a good thing. And uh, we, we will get some questions uh, from uh, now. So questions? Dr. Rungchai, could you please stop yes. sharing your screen? Uh, yeah, please. Oh. So that our uh, team can project the uh, question. How to? I just. Uh, you go to the top of your slide. Uh, okay, fine, good. Yeah. Okay. There are the questions, and Professor Mahin and Andrew can uh, moderate this question and answers. Right. Thanks, uh, Dr. Tiaga. So, Prof, uh, there is uh, three questions there. What are the physiological markers and uh, that helps in identifying altitude responders and non-responders? Perhaps you can uh, start uh, explaining to us. Yes. Um, in the old time, they just look at the level of uh, ele electropoietin. Mm -hmm. And some just use an easily one, the just the red blood cell or reticulocyte count. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, since 1999, a group of scientists um, 
Chinese scientists, they found um, the hypoxic inducible factor one, HIF1. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think this is in terms of genetics. This HIF1 is, um, is, a, what, is a universal regulator of oxygen homeostasis. Induce, it's induced some kind of changes for the body. Um, mm -hmm. It's regulate our metabolism. It uh, has been proved to uh, induce some kind of good buffering capacity for the body. It mm -hmm. has been proved to uh, regulate our uh, glucose metabolism as well. So people believe that the adaptation from the, this genetic factor is a critical point to be investigated. Okay. And okay. if the buffering capacity is good, that means your, your endurance, your tolerance going to be greater. Thanks, Rob. I think uh, that, that markers are very important markers for identifying for the altitude responders here. So, Prof, how, which ideal method that you will be recommending, hyperbaric or normal baric for altitude training? I recommend the normal baric. Normal baric. Any yeah, reason? It's quite easy. Oh, quite easy. <laughs> oh, because if you, if you induce, for, for example, for the tent, I give you the example for the tent. If you induce uh -huh. uh, uh, the hyperbaric tent, uh -huh. Uh -huh, you can imagine the tent gonna collapse. Right, right, right. Because the air pressure outside. If you induce the hyperbaric tent, mm -hmm. the tent gonna be exploded. <laughs> mm. And in that case, think about the explosion. If you have the hyperbaric chamber with high amount of oxygen, that's the mm. the the what the bomb. <laughs> that's the bomb. When you run the hyperbaric hyperoxic chamber, one mm -hmm. recommendation for me, the strong recommendation is that don't bring any electrical electrical equipment, even a polar monitoring heart rate inside. Uh -huh. Just an ignition of the uh, electric current is gonna explode everything. <laughs> All right. Okay. Due to the pressure, yeah, because that's a very good, uh, important uh, message for people to, uh, those who are doing with the altitude training, need to be in there, very yes. careful with the instruments, yeah. Because when I was yes. in the Everest base camp uh, many years ago, our students climbed up to the Mount Everest. Two of our students climbed up and a few more from our staffs have climbed up to Mount Everest as well. We did a small research studies and everything. We, we do feel uh, problems with the instruments and everything. So that is open and this is a close uh, chambers and everything. So that's very interesting uh, to know that part. We have to learn from the experience. Prof, the other aspect is what is the ideal time to return from the altitude training uh, and the optimal sea level performance? Uh, from from my my study, uh, mm -hmm. we trained for four weeks. We got the we got the peak of their performance, and we follow for another week. Mm -hmm. For the second week, all peak decline. Okay. So you have to count back. If you you have to count back the time okay. into if if you want to participate in any sport event up there on top of the mountain, you have to think back about about five or six week. Okay. So you have to uh, acclimatize to it and do some training. This is what the Korean national team did mm -hmm. in Brazil. Okay. They stayed there for two months before the games. Oh. They got so much money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Professor Mahir, and uh, thank you, Dr. Unchai. And uh, I would like to request Andrew to share his pearls of experience, especially if uh, places like Joburg, which are slightly high altitude, back home at South Africa, what's the experience like, altitude training? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, at the moment, we have we have a couple of cities that are, are relatively high. Johannesburg is based just over, it's about 2,000 meters high. So it's, it's not quite as high as Mexico. So a lot of our, our local sports teams and our high performance centers are actually based up in Johannesburg and Pretoria, which is, which is considered high, high-ish. Um, and we certainly see just locally when when various teams from various um, sporting events train and play against each other, we definitely see over the last five or six years, they're starting to take altitude into account and the changes in the climatic conditions. 
Um, previously, some of our teams, specifically our soccer teams, used to travel from from uh, from Cape Town, which is at sea level, up to Johannesburg, and they used to travel two or three days before. And I think because of science, like what Dr. Rungchow has, has has given evidence of, they've now changed the way that they do that. They either travel the day before, or they travel on the same day, just a lot earlier, to try and avoid that negative effect of living and training low and being exposed to high altitude. Um, still, in South Africa, I think the you know, while we have cities and, and quite big cities that are, are based at high, at high levels, we don't simulate um, high level training at this level. Uh, and I think pre predominantly, it sounds like one of the reasons, one of the main reasons as identified by the, by the prof is that it's because it's a financial consideration. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of our sporting federations would be much better suited into spending that money in other areas rather than just looking on, on whether altitude they could get into those chambers and, and the cost of it. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Andrew, uh, for the valuable feedback. So at the end of every speech, we plan to have a short poll. So here is the question. All those who are in the Zoom meeting, the moderators, the participants, the speakers can uh, respond to the poll. The question is, uh, does hypoxic training improve the repeat sprint ability? Yes, no. Maybe not every time. <laughs> so we are seeing some very flash responses. And 20 seconds to go before we close this poll. So we have almost 60%. We will give a winner, we will give a, winner a big clap after the session. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the participants answer. Let, let. Let me answer for you. Yeah, eight and It's a tough. Just click, bro. Just click. It's a tough fight, actually, between <laughs> top prizes. Okay. Okay, five seconds more before we have some more people pulling in. And yes, <laughs> it's like a 2020 match. I'll share the results now. You will be surprised. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so match is ending in a tie. Hi. So uh, that's fun, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. that's good. We can debate uh, more about this uh, and uh, we can go to the next talk uh, since we are uh, short of time now. Yeah. Next, uh, my group friend working with me in my uh, Malaysian Association of Sport Medicine. Uh, Dr. Austin uh, Chung Wai Kwong. He's a sport physician working in the University of Malaya uh, Medical Center, the unit for sports medicine, and who's uh, been there for a couple of years. And we have done a lot of research in this uh, physical activity, uh, musculoskeletal injuries, and all this kind of research. Uh, and also regenerative medicine. He's a certified uh, dry needling practitioner. So don't play with him, he will poke you. <laughs> and uh, he also cover a lot of national and international sports events in this country and as well as in overseas. Currently, uh, he's our secretary, honorary secretary for the Malaysian Association of Sport Medicine and an active member of the ASEAN Federation of Sport Medicine and also in the International Federation of Sport Medicine, where we all work together to promote. Uh, we will share, uh, he will talk about the physical activity amid COVID-19 uh, pandemics. So it's a very interesting time to know what is this COVID uh, have giving us effects and how is this physical activity has been influenced. Uh, without further ado, let me welcome my good friend, Dr. Alston Chung. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Prof Mahin, for the very nice introductions. Okay. So, first and foremost, 
Um, thank you uh, to International, to India Association of Sport Medicines for inviting me as uh, one of the um, speaker for Web Binar, which is uh, the Web Binar. Web Binar is in collaboration with uh, Malaysian Association of Sport Medicines and also Asian Federation of Sport Medicines. So today, I will be talking about physical activity amidst uh, COVID-19 pandemics. First, I have a um, very brief introduction about myself. Um, I'm Elston Chong. I'm a sport and exercise med medicine physician from University Malaya Medical Center. I'm also the medical lecturer uh, in University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia and also the Honorary Secretary for Malaysian's Association of Sport Medicine. So the topics that uh, I'm going to cover today includes, um, we'll talk briefly um, the what, what is the coronavirus uh, COVID-19 pandemic about, and how does this um, COVID-19 uh, affect on the physical activities, what are the benefits of physical activities? And uh, what, are the, what, what, what are the available options that we can do uh, in terms of uh, physical, physical activity at home? And uh, if we want to go back to, the, to do physical activity at gym, is it feasible? And also how about doing physical, physical activity outdoors? And uh, I will also share some of my preliminary results uh, from my study regarding physical activity at home. Okay, as we know, um, the coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic um, until now already have a total confirmed cases of 15.7 million with the recovered uh, 9.05 million cases and uh, 640 of, 640K of deaths. And um, this virus is transmitted mainly by uh, air, air, uh, air droplets. Imagine when someone infected, uh, when he is sneezing or coughing, the virus will be uh, transmitted through uh, air droplets, uh, through, the, uh, uh, con through, through the airborne droplets. And then uh, if the person's doesn't wash hand, there will also be a direct contact from the air droplets. And now uh, when uh, the infected person touch four mites, and there will, this will occur in, uh, in direct contact uh, from other person that touching the same place. Okay, because of this uh, pandemic, a lot of countries have undergo lockdowns or home confinements including Malaysia. The home confinement lockdown caused uh, places such as uh, the playgrounds, uh, is closing down, there is a restriction or travel ban to, uh, in many of the country which still are closing the borders. And then uh, there's also close down of the gym and uh, even in many major sport event, football league, um, uh, uh, earlier they are actually still closed down, but uh, now they are open, but it's not open to the public yet. And however, um, like countries such as Malaysia, uh, we are in our recovery uh, phase of uh, movement control order. So we actually allow visiting uh, uh, within our country. So uh, now is actually the best times to visit places such as, uh, and also to enjoy places uh, such as uh, beautiful beaches uh, in our own countries. How about the effect of COVID-19 on physical activities? We know that because of this prolonged home confinements and lockdowns, there will be uh, uh, reduce in physical activities. People tend to have um, increase in sittings and also screening times. And this may actually lead to uh, sedentary lifestyles. And at the same time, 
um, a lot of them have uh, has been exploring or has been inventing uh, new recipes from the kitchens uh, and cooking more than uh, uh, the amount more than the uh, unusual and uh, this will actually uh, foster the unhealthy eating habits and we also know the physical inactivities will worsen the chronic diseases uh, such as the diabetes, hyperpressure, dyslipidemia, and this will also increase the risk of the cardiovascular. And in a way, this will increase the morbidity and mortality, which is related to COVID-19. Among the benefits of the exercise, we know that moderate intensity of physical activity can actually improve uh, immune system. And uh, Exercise also can improve cardiovascular and respiratory functions and also reduce the risk of chronic diseases uh, such as diabetes, uh, hyper hypertension, dyslipidemia, uh, ischemic heart disease, and cancer, certain kind of cancer, especially breast, colorectal. And all these will actually reduce the risk of getting severe disease and death uh, when a person uh, was infected with uh, COVID-19. At the same time, physical activity itself also uh, may lower the level of anxiety, depression, and also persistent stress because of uh, a prolonged stay at home, uh, financial uh, burdens, retrenchment, uh, family problems, and etc. due to the uh, impact of the COVID. Okay, we know that um, I think this one has been discussed by uh, Dr. John last week regarding the risk of uh, the J curve, uh, which is the risk of URTI versus exercise loads. In uh, the usual populations, um, moderate exercise initially can actually um, reduce uh, the risk of getting URTI up to 40 to 50%. However, if the exercise load go higher uh, in someone which is uh, not properly trained or novice exerciser, there is an increased risk of uh, URTI up to two to six fold. However, in the case of um, elite athletes, the, this is actually slightly different. The elite athlete actually show the S-shaped model, which is um, because um, even with the high intensity of exercise load, if you have a reduced reduce of the in infection risk of uh, URTI because of physiological and also psychological adaptations. Okay, so now because um, a, a lot of countries is still undergoing uh, lockdown or and also uh, movement restrictions. So being physically active at home is very important. So uh, WHO together with FIFA and United Nations, they actually have come out uh, with um, the hashtag be active, hashtag healthy at home to encourage people to keep themselves active uh, even though they are staying at home. Examples of the activities that can be done, such as uh, online exercise classes, uh, like following um, uh, exercise on uh, YouTube, uh, visual exercise programs uh, with friends is, is one of the good choices. Uh, but bear in mind for Norway's uh, exerciser, uh, if you are not familiar to those kind of exercise, try not to go too fast or do it too intense because there is a, there is a high risk of you getting injuries. Um, example, um, I actually have a few, few patients that come to me because of um, the first one is uh, follow certain programs and uh, they actually request him to do 20 minutes of burpee uh, in one time. And then the other patients uh, have to do 200 times of push up in a day. That is actually uh, very, very intense for someone which are not used to that kind of exercise. Other example would be uh, jumping ropes, 
dancing, which is a very good alternative. Um, we actually advocate, we actually suggest um, to have uh, muscle strengthening and also uh, aerobic exercise, which is the concurrent training. Um, the muscle train uh, supposed to uh, focus on big muscle groups like uh, the lower limb, the tris, the quadriceps, uh, the uh, uh, hamstring, and then the sh upper limb, shoulder, uh, the uh, bicep, triceps, and etc. So apart from the uh, muscle strengthenings and also uh, aerobic exercise, um, it's also important also to add on flexibility or neuromuscular exercise, which includes the, the balancing and also proprioception, especially in elderly. And for kids, um, they always got the issues of uh, easily uh, get bored, not able to focus. So family member is actually important uh, in, uh, in playing a role to keep the cell, to keep the kids active. And one of the ways is by playing active video games uh, that actually involve a lot of body movement, uh, uh, such as uh, dancing, uh, uh, ritual tennis uh, with them. Okay, a lot of people have the mindset of uh, exercise actually confined to a structural, um, repetitive plan program. In fact, um, physical activity is just a bodily, any bodily movement that involves skeletal muscles uh, and then and expert and and use uh, energy. So some of the how household chores, example like um, cleaning, gardening, uh, mopping, is also a very good uh, way of physical activities at home. So uh, if it's possible, um, we try to do what we call uh, the non-thermogenesis activity, uh, non-energy uh, activity thermogenesis net as much as possible. Uh, we try to break um, uh, probably about two minutes in between uh, 20 minutes uh, sitting and uh, we can actually walk around the house or climbing stairs and also do uh, some stretching uh, in between during our work, working at home. So this is uh, one of the questionnaire, which is called the PESQ, pre-exercise screening questionnaire, in which uh, consists of uh, seven short questions that uh, you can use for you uh, before you to start exercise. Basically, this questionnaire will ask about uh, uh, some symptoms such as sore throat, cough, uh, fatigue, shortness of breath, and, and fever. And then the last two questions would be uh, fever more than three days and also any close contact with persons that have diagnosed or suspected to have coronavirus. If let's say you answer yes to question number six or seven, then you have to seek uh, for medical advice before starting your exercise. If it's no, for all the other questions, for all the questions, then you are pretty safe to uh, start your exercise. Of course, some of the country, they do allow um, the uh, people to go to the gym, to the fitness center. So there's this gym hygiene which is very important, which is, um, uh, I always practice these rules, which is uh, above and below the neck. Let's say you have the symptoms of uh, fever, myoja, which is a uh, muscle pain, muscle ache, joint ache, uh, generalized body ache, which is below the neck, you, you are not supposed to go to the gym because you are generally feeling unwell. But let's say you are you're having symptoms which is above the neck, okay, um, this will be, uh, will be on a, a bit um, equ equivocal because uh, it's better for you to control the cough first if, or to control the cough and without having any, having, uh, any UTI, URTI symptom first before going to the gym. And then in the gym, it's very important to practice, uh, the, again, the proper hand hygiene, minimize uh, contact, keep at least one meter apart and avoid touching face, 
uh, especially uh, your nose, eye, and also the ear, and also weed down all those equipments every time before and after use. So how about physical activity outdoors? There's uh, against different countries has different restriction and rules and also different SOP on different sport trainings, okay? So um, the main advice is uh, try to avoid crowd, large crowd or large gathering and uh, always practice physical distancing, which is uh, one meter apart. Avoid unnecessary touching and also adequate hand hygiene. The um, WHO actually doesn't uh, suggest wearing masks during exercise, uh, partly because of uh, two reasons. One is because uh, wearing uh, mask during exercise uh, to some people might actually cause uh, breathing problems and causing hyperventilations. And then the second reason is a uh, mask. Uh, when the mask get wet, it's actually uh, serve as a serve as a source uh, for the growth of, of the bacteria and also reduce the efficacy uh, in terms of the uh, one way protections. Okay. So um, Blockland actually did uh, aerodynamic studies and uh, he even suggests that um, when the two people are walking front and the back, the distance is supposed to keep four to five meters for uh, walking. For running, this should be at least 10 meters and uh, cycling should be uh, increased up to 20 meters. But this is just based on a uh, uh, lab uh, aerodynamic studies. Okay, so um, I actually did a study on physical activity level, motivations, knowledge, and challenges during the lockdown or move, movement control amid uh, COVID-19 outbreak among Malaysian adults, which is a cross-sectional study. Currently, the study is uh, still unpublished, uh, and I will present some of the preliminary results. So um, generally, there is a reduction of physical activity level uh, with a sample size of 967. So um, the physical activity level, uh, re regardless of the level of intensity, there is a reduction uh, for total vigorous, moderate, and even for walking. And uh, on the other side, there is an increase in uh, sitting time. And all this is uh, significant. In terms of gender difference, um, there is no significant gender difference um, in terms of the physical activity level and sitting time. But there is a generally there is a reduction uh, for physical activity level for both male and female, and also increased sitting time for both male and female. For different age group, um, for the total physical activity levels, there is a general reduction uh, for regardless of the age group. However, uh, in terms of sitting time, although the three age group it is, is increased, but there is a significant difference in which the younger age group tend to sit more compared to the older age group. Um, this can be because of a uh, younger age group uh, probably they are the one that are working from home. So they tend to have a longer time uh, on, on sitting in front of the computer and then uh, prolonged sitting and also uh, screening time. In terms of marital, marital status, um, surprisingly, there is a significant uh, level for both uh, total uh, physical activity levels and so sitting times. For the physical activity levels, although all the uh, status increase, all, all the status reduce, but there is a significant reduction between um, those that single with those that married. Okay, so this, re this reduction, that's mean people which is uh, single, they tend to have a lower physical activity level. Um, what, what I can ex, uh, uh, explain is probably uh, married persons, they have to take care of their children and uh, they have uh, more works to do. That's, that's why they move more. 
okay? Uh, in terms of sitting times also, um, single tend to sit longer compared to the uh, married persons and uh, the significant level is uh, less than 0 0.05. Okay, there is no significant difference uh, in terms of uh, area of living, okay? Uh, both people living in urban and rural area have a uh, reduced in the physical activity levels and also increase in the sitting times. In terms of education levels, uh, there's also no significant difference. Uh, regardless of the education level, both have uh, reduced in the physical activity levels and increased in the sitting time. Okay. For household income, there's also uh, no significant difference. Um, and then generally there's a reduction in physical activity levels and increase in the sitting time. Okay. However, for the type of residents, uh, interestingly, there is this, um, there is significant difference between those that are staying in the high rise uh, residence like condominium flats uh, compared to those staying in uh, semi D or bungalow. The physical activity level is lower for those staying in high rise uh, residence. Okay, probably because there is a lack uh, uh, space. Uh, confinement restriction, and then they have uh, no space to move, to exercise. And then uh, in terms of sitting time also, there is a significant increase uh, in uh, those sit, uh, staying in high rise uh, residence compared to the Samidi and Bangalore. Okay, uh, uh, there is no difference between household occupants um, for the between the different uh, household occupants groups. And I do did a correlations between, to check whether there is any correlations between the level of uh, physical activities and also motivations. Uh, however, I couldn't find any significant correlations in between uh, the total motivations and also the different type of the sub skills. Uh, in terms of the correlations between level of uh, physical activity and also knowledge, I also didn't find any significant uh, correlations. Okay, so these are some of the challenges um, uh, from the feedback uh, from the respondents. Mainly, um, uh, they say uh, there is a uh, space limitations when trying to do physical activity at home. There's also time constraint because uh, working from home uh, tend to have more work and some of them, they have to take care of their children, other family members as well. And then uh, some, uh, even some of them, they are not actually working from home, they are still going to the office. And then uh, when they are work from home, there's interruption from the family member, from their pets, okay, which actually uh, stop them from, uh, from doing physical activity. And then there is no conductive environment like gym, pool, court, or parks for them to jog for them to uh, do their regular uh, exercise. And then there is lack of e equipment at home. Another, some of them also complains there is a lack of motivation. They are unable to uh, self-discipline. A lot of them complain laziness, bored when uh, doing exercise at home. And uh, they just enjoy and doing uh, outdoor activity rather than doing uh, exercise at home. And many of them also say that they do not have any guidance and they are unsure uh, correct exercise technique when following the, YouTube, uh, the online videos or virtual classes. And then uh, there's also limitless of new kitchen recipe or food being created uh, that actually uh, stop them from uh, uh, physically active and make them put on weights. And I think uh, some of them are uh, actually uh, uh, undergo uh, fasting during the Ramadan month for Muslim. And the last thing is uh, some of them also complain internet pro connection problems, probably because uh, uh, they need the internet connections to, to do the virtual classes and also to follow the online exercise. Okay, my summary will be, uh, it's important 
during this uh, period to maintain a regular physical activities so that we can maintain our physical and mental health. Uh, always remember progressive, progressive loading, precautions uh, not to injure yourself at this moment and uh, try to uh, uh, do follow exercise, go slow and uh, follow the correct techniques. And then in terms of outdoor trainings or physical activities in the gyms, always follow and uh, adhere to the rules, regulations and SOP for uh, that set by different countries. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, uh, thanks, Alston. Very interesting. Uh, uh, explanation on physical activity and uh, I think uh, your challenges is not there that, that much. There's plenty more. I think people are telling <laughs> I don't want to do exercise. I've got so many things like that and everything. I, I believe on that. Mm -hmm. I, I think you have put the signs uh, on the importance of physical activity, how for a normal people and as well for an athlete, you show the J curve of, from Neyman and then the other curve of S curve and everything. That's very interesting to know people know must know that the science is there on the exercise why we are trying to tell them to do exercise Austin, can you stop sharing uh, so that we can uh, project the questions for you yeah the questions are there uh andrew you want to start oh okay. sure sure yeah. um let's just go through the first question sorry we don't have a lot of time but the first one yeah. is just how to minimize the risk associated with unmonitored physical activity amongst athletes during the COVID situation? Okay. So the first question, how to minimize the risk uh, with unmonitored physical activity among athletes? Um, the, in terms of uh, risk reduction, it's always important to follow the rules of progressive overloads that means um, uh, when even okay even during the lockdowns or during the uh, movement restrictions, uh, most of the athletes they are doing uh, certain form of certain kinds of training at home, but the trainings is simply not the same, and it's uh, basically just some general aerobic or uh, HIIT or body weight training. So it's pretty not sport specific. So when they go back to uh, the, the, their usual training, when the lockdown is lifted, they have to go very, the coach uh, and then the uh, strength and conditions uh, coach, uh, they have to be very aware and have, they have to be uh, uh, customized, customized a, a, a program and probably to if it's possible to start from scratch uh, so that it is possible to reduce the risk of injury in uh, mm. at least when they return back to the sports. Yeah, I think we've also we've experienced that a lot of our sports people are getting online and just downloading different types of workouts. And we seeing we are seeing a sudden increase in different injuries, different injuries that aren't yeah, exactly. associated with the sport. So I think it's something definitely. And I think that probably comes into the second question as well regarding health promotion strategies for school going children. Uh, do you have any comments on that? You know, how do we how do we reduce the risk or at least get our school kids to stay active as much as possible? Okay, the health promotion strategy uh, for school going children is always a very, a very challenge topic because um, like in Malaysia or in many parts of the world, although there have been many uh, obesity or overweight prevented, prevention interventions, but uh, the obesity or overweight rate still keep on rising. So usually um, this has to be a multidisciplinary approach, which uh, involve not just uh, the physical activity alone, uh, another part will be uh, the, from the, the nutrition uh, to actually uh, give a proper education uh, on uh, dietary intake. The third part will be from the counsellor to, uh, to actually uh, uh, counselling on uh, uh, why is 
why, what is the reasons of, uh, what, what are the side effects or the complications of uh, overweight on obese. And I think the very important roles and involvement will be from the family and also from the friends uh, to, and all this to come together uh, to help the kids to keep, to, to maintain the uh, physical activity and to help them to uh, maintain the fitness. Right. Excellent. Thank you very much. And thank you, Alston, for the wonderful session. Very important. May we have a quick poll now with a very burning question on everyone's mind. I'll just share the second question for the poll. Yes. Physical activity and exercise in COVID positive persons, but mild or asymptomatic. Is this allowable or not? Or do you feel it's there is no evidence for or against? We have some 40 seconds more for everyone to pull in. Very interesting findings so far. So the exercise and physical activity in COVID positive cases, most of them are required to be quarantined at their homes very strictly. So whatever exercise they can do, do we have evidence or not? Or is it must or it is not allowed? So we have almost uh, 50, 60, 70 percent of people have polled. There are five seconds to go before I release the results. Some people are even thinking very hard now. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's go with the results. Guess what? So most of us have feeling that it's not allowed. I think this will uh, keep evolving the answer to this question as we find more evidence. I would have chosen no evidence or for or against at present, at least, till people like Dr. Alston come up with more studies. Thank you. Yeah. That's it for me. I, I think the current best practice is uh, asymptomatic, tested positive, uh, they have to stop for two weeks and then uh, wait until they, the, these two weeks they are okay, then only slowly they are, will be allowed back. Some, some of the country, they even test, test, retest again after two weeks. Thank you, Dr. Alston. And over to the moderators for the next session. Sandro? Thank you very much. Uh, I, get the, I get the wonderful opportunity to introduce our next speaker. Uh, it's our third speaker of the day. It's Dr. Malini Karupia, um, who is currently a sports physician in the hospital of Serdang, Malaysia. Um, she received her master's degree in sports medicine from the university in Malaya. Um, she's also currently the, the medical and anti-doping committee of the Olympic Council of Malaysia and is also on the executive council uh, as a member in the Malaysian Association of Sports Medicine. Um, her talk today, from what I understand, is on women and activity-related issues. Um, and just in the preamble to this, I was very excited to meet her and there's a lot of excitement around her talk. So Dr. Molina, if you can take us away, please. Yeah, Andrew, thank you so much for the uh, very warm and uh, kind uh, introduction. Um, let me just share. Okay. All right. Uh, just uh, um, I am uh, based in Malaysia. I'm working in Hospital Sudang with the uh, Ministry of Health currently, as well as an ESCO member of the MASM. And uh, as you can see, I have uh, my fellow colleagues here, Prof Mahin, uh, even uh, Dr. Elston earlier, uh, the speaker, uh, and as well as Prof uh, Halim, who did a webinar as well a, a week ago. So today I'll be talking about uh, women and activity-related issues, as well as since we're going through the uh, pandemic of uh, COVID-19, uh, what are the effects of, uh, uh, of the COVID-19 on women as well as girls? So my uh, overview about uh, today's uh, topic would be about sex and gender differences, the effect of menstrual cycle and performance, the psychological stress, the level of exercise and the complication of exercise associated menstrual irregularities, the eating disorder, 
adult women exercise in pregnancy as well as po postpartum exercise. And in relation to the uh, COVID-19 impact on women and girls, I will be talking about violence against women, domestic violence, the healthcare workers, women's health, economic shocks, unpaid work, young women and girls conflict as well as migrant. So I'll be just touching the surface uh, due to the um, uh, very short uh, training minutes I do uh, have been given. So to understand about women's health, it requires understanding of both sex and gender. So how do we differentiate between sex and gender? We always talk about that sex and gender. So sex refers to the, uh, the anatomical and physiological differences that characterize a man and woman, okay? And agenda is basically, it's about the sociological, the environmental, as well as the uh, uh, psychological influence that the women are uh, opportunities and access and uh, to support and health. Okay, so sex differences, as I mentioned earlier, it's about the anatomical and physiolog uh, physiological characteristic. Uh, as you all know, female uh, organs, are, they have smaller bone structure. The hormonal differences, obviously there's estrogen uh, and progesterone in uh, the female. And of course, for the male, you have the, uh, the testosterone uh, and also the androgen hormone. Uh, so uh, when it comes to physiological, uh, we're talking about estrogen and progesterone, and there's a lower testosterone level in most, most uh, general women. Okay, there have been a lot of articles have been done about uh, differences between male and female health benefits, which is derived from physical activity and the implications of exercise on it whether it affects your hormones, like for the male, whether your androgens, your testosterone, and as well as the, as, as the female, uh, about your progesterone, about your, uh, your estrogen. And like, as you can see here on this uh, screen, there are female specific factors as well as non-specific factors, all right? So we have uh, for the physiological, as I mentioned earlier, we have the menstrual cycle, pregnancy and menopause. We have a few stages where a woman goes through and it all comes down to the uh, uh, cycle, the menstrual cycle. And then it's pr pregnancy prevention. What about uh, contraceptive? Uh, whether hormonal contraceptives, also you have implants and all that. And also for the others, uh, hormonal tra treatments such as replacement therapy, those who undergo through menopause or hysterectomy. Uh, do you advise them to take um, uh, replacement therapy, hormonal replacement therapy? Okay. So then male versus female athletes, okay? Uh, as you can uh, know that uh, one of the main characteristic or differences between a male and female are obviously the body size, the body composition, which uh, uh, talks about muscle, uh, muscle mass. You have uh, uh, the cardiac output, the muscle strength, as well as the pulmonary ventilation, and also the amount of testosterone and as well as estrogen and pro progesterone. Okay, and when we talk about uh, uh, women or, or even girls, we're talking about a lifespan of stage. We talk about uh, girlhood, we talk about adolescence, adult woman, and older woman. And we talk about uh, sex issues, sometimes it relates to a certain uh, musculoskeletal injury. As you all know, uh, in the adolescence, you can get an uh, uh, Oshkut slatter, uh, which might be even earlier in girls compared to boys, even though it, it has been stated that sometimes boys do get it more often than girls. And, and because of this, sometimes in certain policies, in certain uh, competitive uh, matches such as ice hockey, it uh, has been um, uh, restricted for girls from competing in ice hockey in order to uh, prevent from Osgood Slatter disease to uh, take place. And then you have in adolescence, uh, there's a high incidence of stress fracture uh, because it might be increased if there's a low level of estrogen. And for gender issues, uh, due to increased body image concern in this particular adolescence group, uh, as you know, are known as a teenager or even a young adult, uh, there may be a barrier for sports participation. Adult woman, that might be a sex issue relating to pregnancy, okay, a breastfeeding, uh, with the effect of physical activity. And also for gender issue, there might be uh, domestic violence, which may affect women more than men, often so, and also with MSK injuries. And for older women, uh, we, there might be an increased incidence of OA, uh, especially in the weight bearing. As you all know, the medial knee, uh, that's where our weight bearing is. So increase of OA in the medial knee aspect. And for gender issue, there may be lack of lifespan role models about personal exercise experience, making this a challenge for women to start exercising at a later age, especially when they're much older. So there's also a lot of articles uh, about effect of menstrual cycle phase on sprinting performance. 
And uh, as you all can see, uh, this is a, a very simple, very basic menstrual cycle um, in a woman. We have the ovulation phase and also we have the follicular phase and the luteal phase. And it, it has been said that uh, if a woman is extremely active due to the high increased level of exercise level, their luteal phase tend to be shortened. Normally, it's about 10 to 14 days. But when there's very um, high level of activity and exercise involved, and then the luteal phase tend to shorten from 10 to 14, it might come even shorter. But they might still even be getting a regular period every month. It is just that their phase is a bit more shortened compared to a, uh, to a less active uh, female. All right. So what are the special problems faced by women in, uh, or a sports person? All right. So there's a lot of menstrual dysfunction. You can uh, uh, define them in a few categories, such as absence of menstrual period. Normally, when you say absence of menstrual period, normally it should be a period of 12 months continuously where you don't have your period. Abdominal cramps, heavy or prolonged periods, irregular periods, as well as delay in first menstrual period. All right. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, there's amenorrhea. Okay. There's oligoaminorrhea. There's menorrhagia with profuse bleeding. There's metorrhagia where you have breakthrough bleeding, uh, hypomenorrhea, scanty bleeding, dysmenorrhea, as well as premenstrual syndrome, such as uh, very bad lower uh, abdominal cramps, uh, mood swings, and also your, you, you, your, your performance level might reduce as well during this particular phase. So there's something called female athlete triad. And a lot of uh, athletes, especially those who require them to have uh, a lesser calorie deficit, uh, especially like gymnasts, and uh, they do have this, um, uh, this female athlete triad, which consists of menstrual disturbances or complete amenorrhea, bone loss or osteoporosis, as well as energy deficit disorder eating. So as you can see here, uh, when, there's a, uh, when there's either a functional hypothalamic amenorrhea and also there'll be a low energy availability with or without an eating disorder. And uh, because when they are, they are so concerned about uh, having a certain amount of body weight in order to perform better, they tend to uh, really minimize their calorie. And um, this might also lead to a prolonged effect of osteoporosis. And uh, because of the low BMD, and uh, some of the uh, at least may even get U uh, minoria, as well as uh, the optimal energy availability uh, might reduce based on this uh, athlete female trial. Okay. Uh, so that's why when we come towards uh, exercise pres prescription, uh, just not for the uh, active uh, elite athletes, but also like what uh, Dr. Tiaga mentioned earlier about uh, weekend warriors, even Dr. Arumugan is mentioning, uh, you know how nowadays we have a, a female and also uh, the uh, uh, quite a high population. When we do uh, excess prescription, there's something called uh, FITT as well as EP. So FITT stands for frequency, intensity, their times, as well as the type. And the recent one they've updated is they've e included E and P, which stands for enjoyment and progression. Because without enjoyment, it, your uh, exercise that uh, someone who's about to do a weekend warrior, that it, it might not sustain. And uh, if they don't have a progression and there's no enjoyment, so therefore the uh, uh, the exercise physician might, might not follow through for anyone that we do prescribe as an exercise physician. So, and when it comes uh, to uh, someone who's pregnant, uh, people have this uh, stigma where, uh, you know, uh, oh, if you're pregnant, you're not supposed to be working out or whether they're too conscious to work out or someone who's been very active, are they supposed to or not to? Actually, uh, according to the American College of um, uh, Obstetricians and Gynecologists, ACOG, uh, it's really recommended to do uh, exercise, uh, but it all depends on whether you have uh, any contraindications. Uh, I will come there to you in a, in a bit. So as you can see, the recommended uh, exercise during our sports during pregnancy are walking, swimming, cycling if you're used to, running, yoga and pilates, uh, racket sports, and strength training, which you have to modify. And to be avoided, you have to uh, at least avoid uh, contact sports, such as football, rugby, boxing, activities with high risk of falling. Why is it high risk of falling? Because our center of gravity, when a woman is pregnant, the center of gravity is, um, is shifted. So therefore, they don't have a very good balance. So that is why high risk of falling, such as horse riding, downhill skiing, surfing, and also gymnastic uh, is a, a big uh, no. And obviously scuba diving, vigorous exercising in a hot water, and also hiking above 2,000 meters. All right. So for example, we do have uh, yeah, at least, for example, Serena Williams. 
uh, she was uh, pregnant and she sent the internet into a frenzy after revealing, revealing that she was two months pregnant when she won a 23rd Grand Slam title at the Australian Open in January. And our very own Malaysian, uh, Noor Suryani Mohamad Taibi, a shooter from Malaysia, she competed at the Royal uh, Artillery Barracks while she was eight, uh, eight months pregnant. So even if you're pregnant or not, uh, it, it's not a, a hindrance uh, to, to, uh, to participate in the sport, but it's always good to get your, uh, you know, your ONG as well as your sport physician uh, to rule out uh, before you could uh, participate. And like I mentioned earlier, there's always a contraindications if you want to exercise. There is something called absolute as well as relative contraindication. Uh, uh, relative contraindication. Absolute basically is a, it's a complete no. Uh, if you have a uh, hemodynamically insignificant heart disease, uh, you have uh, multiple gestation, you're pregnant with twins, or you have a premature labor, uh, or maybe you had a rupture of membrane or severe anemia. Okay, so relative contraindication, for example, uh, if you have chronic bronchitis, a, a, a poorly controlled type 1 diabetes, and also a BMI less than 12. All right, so there's a few examples of uh, absolute and uh, uh, relative contraindication. And as you can uh, see here, the um, ACOG or as well as the ACSM, uh, they've given a few guidelines about female uh, uh, athletes who are pregnant, how to prevent uh, further musculoskeletal injuries. Why is, is this so? It's because when you're pregnant, you tend to have um, your hormone uh, lexin, which is a, more like a relaxing hormone. It tends to make uh, you to be a bit more um, uh, susceptible to MSK injuries. So what are the uh, excess guidelines which are given? Basically, it's about 30 to 5, 45 minutes a day or at least three times a week. Uh, you can do resistant endurance training and avoid proline supine position or motionless standing. And also, as I mentioned earlier, avoid high or deep water and valsava manure such as weightlifting and always use a box scale, all right, to sort of like uh, indicate whether you are uh, feeling okay or you're feeling in the, in, in the, in the mid zone or whether in the very severe of uh, exertion. So then you know where to stop or if you, if you are allowed to continue your exercise. All right. So the same thing here, when you have ACOG guidelines for exercise uh, during pregnancy as well as postpartum, uh, it's the same thing. You have to make sure you uh, avoid anything which is high risk of falling, uh, no exercise in supine position, no extremes or barometric pressure, and uh, also avoid any warm up or cool down, uh, and also use a talk test or RPE as your exercise intensity. All right. And why do female athletes have a more high uh, chance of getting MSK? It's because of the way their uh, knees, their joints, knee joints move on towards the uh, inward of landing because they're two times more risk of patellar femoral pain and 15 times more risk of a future ACL injury. All right. So one of the reasons why uh, women tend to get uh, more ACL injury is because they have a greater Q angle compared to the male counterparts. All right. As you can see here, the uh, a typical female has a large Q angle compared to the uh, a typical male who has a, a smaller Q angle. So this is one of the reasons where they have a very high susceptibility to get an ACL injury. Because as you all know, ACL injury, uh, one of the main thing is to have a pivot mechanism, okay, shifted and also to have uh, a Q angle uh, in a large Q angle in a female. All right, so as you can see here, uh, uh, you have ACL injuries, you have meniscus injuries, um, uh, and jumper's knee, Oshkut slatter, and also uh, etc. And a lot of it, as you can see here, ACL injuries, one of the more, most common injuries in a female, uh, surprisingly compared to even to contact sports, which is played by a uh, male. All right. So factors that influence the women versus the uh, men, as you can see here, obviously hormones, primarily estrogen for the female and we have a male for the androgen, the bone structure, the musculature, you have less muscle in females compared to males, the alignment, that's why they have mild alignment syndrome. And um, as you can see, women have a lot of common injuries such as concussion, fracture, dislocation, muscle strains, ankle strains, as well as ACL injury, which is five more likely compared uh, to men. So there's always modifiable and non-modifiable. When we break into uh, uh, causes, we always have to mention about modifiable, non-modifiable, as well as intrinsic and extrinsic uh, um, um, uh, uh, causes. So uh, you have um, the fitness level in modifiable, okay? Muscle strength, flexibility. Intrinsic is basically within us. Extrinsic is something outside of us. 
So basically, uh, you have the clothing, the playtime, the endurance, non-modifiable, which we are unable to modify, which is age, gender, maturity, and previous injury. And of course, the extrinsic, such as the type of sport, the sports context, the weather, as well as level of, comp uh, of competition. So I would like to also talk a bit about, since we're going through a pandemic of COVID-19 and what's going on now, and uh, WHO, especially the, and as well as the UN and the women, they're talking a lot about COVID-19 and uh, about uh, women and girls. And one of the main things they're talking about currently is about uh, violence against women and girls, all right? So how can our health uh, uh, system can help women survivors during the uh, COVID-19? Uh, one of it, uh, which is a World Health Organization, uh, WHO have stated is to identify and share information on support services, including opening hours and contact details. And you establish a referral linkage and you find out uh, what survivors of violence need and how best to reach them safely, okay? And uh, when it comes to government, which can help protect women and uh, children from the violence, uh, it includes violence against women, which are essential services during a COVID-19. Uh, and also the responses and the support, which is the hotlines, the shelters and other specialized services to be provided in the context of COVID-19 prevention measures. And if you're experiencing violence during COVID-19, it's best to uh, ad always advise to reach out, okay, uh, to supportive family members, even just, not just your family members, but even to friends, to neighbors, someone that you can rely on, all right? And always call a hotline or uh, assess the information online if possible and always seek out local uh, services of survivors. And uh, make a safety plan for, your, for, for you and your children. If you're experiencing violence uh, at home or need to leave in a hurry, identify a friend, okay? Plan how to get there and keep ready essential personal belongings. And as you can know, uh, the, uh, the, the shadow of pandemic is going on now against girls and women uh, under the COVID-19. Uh, the uh, WHO is really giving a lot of importance to this. And um, also, uh, women is one of the main uh, forefront of uh, the um, uh, healthcare workers and also the caregivers at home. And uh, uh, sometime at the moment, which uh, the COVID-19, the young people classify as NEET. So NEET stands for not in education, employment or training. Some of them has been uh, retrenched or they're not in employment or whether they are not in training. And 89 of the world's student population as well uh, children and youth out of school due to the COVID-19 uh, closures, all right? And healthcare workers, which I mentioned earlier, 70% are women and 30% uh, in the global health sector. And uh, when we're talking about the health sector, it can be a, uh, a midwife, uh, even nurses, doctors, physicians, all right? So we have uh, the uh, economic impact, what are the health impacts, the unpaid care worker, the gender-based violence, and the effects uh, and impacts in humanitarian and of course, there's heart disease, breast cancer, ovarian and gynecological diseases, which have been uh, rampant throughout this COVID-19. Okay, so gynecological, for example, we have bleeding and uh, discharge uh, during the menstrual cycle. And then after that, during pregnancy issues, uh, you know, uh, during a pre-existing condition, uh, it can also be threatened to a mom, uh, mother and a child, especially if the mother has a, a asthmatic diabetes or even depression, mental health is so important. They're talking about mental health currently, uh, where you know uh, it's either you're having anxiety, depression, bipolar, and a lot of them are during pregnancy when they do have uh, this it can induce also depression due to uh, a fall in the red blood count cells and autoimmune disease. This can accelerate uh, other uh, diseases as well, uh, such as exhaustion, mild fever, pain, and also can lead to osteoporosis and uh, depression, anxiety, like I mentioned, premenstrual syndrome, PMS, premenstrual dimorphic disorder, which are presents uh, uh, somewhat similar, and as well as uh, also something called baby blues after, uh, after um, confinement. Uh, something during this uh, COVID-19, uh, maybe they might not have, um, you know, uh, particular help or they might not have any family members around them staying with them, and it might lead to depression, anxiety, and uh, what are the COVID-19 pandemic telling us about, about gender equality? Firstly, it shows about domestic, sexual, and gender-based violence, which has dramatically increased during this crisis. And it, it, happen, it, it, it happened during the Ebola in 2014, as well as the Zika epidemic, uh, uh, epidemics. And now, secondly, the majority of the frontliners, as I mentioned earlier, are women. And as you can see here, the midwife and nursing, we have the pharmacist, the dentistry, as well as the physician. Uh, most of them are women. 
And women also account for the majority of the world's older population, especially those over 80. And uh, so COVID-19, as I say, is uh, affecting especially the extreme of age. So uh, it's something to look into during this crisis. And what are the COVID action uh, 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 platform and what are concerns need to be addressed? Basically, the viral infection poses serious consequences for mater maternal and neonatal health. And um, uh, through robust research is required uh, in fears of regarding the vertical transmission of 2019. So vertical transmission is basically from mom to baby. That's what we're talking about. And also the preventive antiviral measures must be properly implemented. Everyone obviously should maintain about what we've been talking about, basic um, hygiene, uh, you know, uh, social distancing. And also finally, a collaboration between nations. Uh, it's extremely important to tackle the burden of COVID-19. As you can see, before, during, and after childbirth, during the antenatal, newborn, postnatal, as well as mental health, okay, which is mentioned by World Health Organization. And uh, there is a, a telemedicine via support where you can do at-home monitoring for your weight, blood pressure, fetal heart rate, blood sugar, consultation with a specialist via phone, uh, with your maternal fetal medicine or your genetic counselors, uh, also mental health, uh, also your postpartum. Uh, and also there's, a, there's an algorithm which was brought up during this COVID-19 on uh, how to go about if you are um, just delivered a, a, a newborn, uh, if you are not in high risk, do you get transferred to NICU or nursery and you discuss the care about the infant and also the feeding options, especially during a COVID-19, if you're a breastfeeding positive mom or if you're not. So uh, uh, they have come up with an algorithm as well. And of course, the healthcare workers can help women during uh, survivors of violence during COVID-19, which I mentioned earlier. And um, uh, one of the take home message I would say, uh, keep up to date with the latest COVID-19 information and guidelines from WHO. Take preventive measure, especially in pregnant women to control further spread of the COVID-19. And also to focus on symptomatic treatment as there's no recommended treatment for COVID-19 and promote the uh, effective communication between healthcare professionals and always prioritize care for pregnant women, thereby preventing further uh, infection of the neonates. So um, that is about my presentation today. I hope it was um, uh, sweet but brief about women and uh, sports as well of what is going on with the, with the COVID-19. Thank you very much, Dr. Malini. You certainly didn't disappoint in information and I can understand your passion um, for your topic. Uh, and especially as a woman, and I think there's some definitely some topics that would need to have some further understanding and some further discussion around, but that was very well, very great. Thank you very much. Can I just ask you to stop sharing your screen so we can just answer one or two quick questions, if possible. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go through the two questions we're going to go through, if that's okay with you. Um, can you describe the role of physical activity in combating premenstrual syndrome amongst women? Okay, role of physical uh, activity and combating premenstrual syndrome among women. Uh, like I can mention to you, during the uh, menstrual, especially during the luteal phase, your ovulation uh, phase, which is about 10 to 14 days, uh, your estrogen and progesterone can be quite high. And uh, sometimes when you're having such a high uh, level of um, uh, hormones, uh, it affects whether um, it's your performance or whether it's your mental, whether it's your fatigue sets in early. So uh, when you, if you're a high intensity uh, elite athlete, uh, uh, I would not ask anyone to like completely stop um, any exercise. In fact, just bring your, your intensity to a lower intensity, just like how I would uh, mention earlier about the uh, FIIT and uh, uh, E and P. So the role of physical activity, basically, I would definitely much um, uh, 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 really um, encourage because once you do that, it's always about releasing the uh, endorphins, your feel-good hormones, and therefore you sort of like reduce the chances of getting your, uh, you know, abdomen cramp, as well as um, even uh, not to bring down your uh, level of activity. Yeah, so I suppose especially in these COVID times, it's it's an issue of rather just trying to reduce and manage it as opposed to stopping it completely. Because physical activity appears to even with Dr. Alston, it seems to be an issue. Going forward. Yeah. Okay, great. So the last question here, just to quickly wrap up here, is there a cap on the number of times menstrual cycles can be altered with OCPs in view of sporting events in a calendar year? Yeah. 
so is there a cap on the number of times menstrual cycle can be altered or ciphered? Uh, yeah, uh, the thing is, um, in general, what has been said is, is at least about uh, two or three times a year, uh, because um, uh, in order for you to sometimes, it, 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 it's sort of like you're trying to uh, just buy time. If let's say you were having a major tournament or, or you're coming up with a major uh, activity, and you want to sort of like uh, prolong your period or bring your period forward or backward. So that is why uh, you take your OCPs. Uh, so in normally in a year, uh, it, it, it has been said is about about two to three times, nothing more than three three times to sort of like bring down your uh, menstrual cycle. Great, love thank you. you thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Manley, and thank you, Prof. Mayen. And uh, we have some interesting poll questions for this mm -hmm. burning topic. We have three poll questions, so we'll have only 10, 15 seconds per poll question. Here goes the first question. Can a woman run a, in a marathon six months after a caesarean section delivery? Yes or no? I haven't gone through that. <laughs> <laughs> six months marathon after a caesarean section. We need more responses. 35% people have answered. Some are even thinking, yeah, more are answering. Yes, some more. They can walk also. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Think what? That's, a, that's a brave man to suggest that. <laughs> so we are ending the poll now. And the results are like this. Okay. So we are optimistic. Yes, of course they can run. Andrew, yeah. could you please uh, share your thoughts on this? Because you're <laughs> uh, really yeah. an yourself. Um, I, look, uh, uh, being an athlete that runs marathons, I, I know how hard they are. Um, but again, I, I would refer to my valued professor, Dr. Malini, to answer that question for me. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's a very personal question. Um, I don't, I know how hard marathons are, and when I've been training to run 42 kilometers is still a big effort. Um, All right. in, in, my uh, own, in my own head, I would say no, but I would defer to the good doctor to answer that for me. Okay, Andrew, no, no problem. Um, okay, because um, if you would have a normal delivery, to go back, in order to, to resume back your activities gradually, they always say you can start within a, a week or so. And for C-section, uh, because it's considered a major abdominal surgery, uh, normally the clearance which uh, obstetric and gynecologists would give you at least about six weeks. So for six months for you to run a marathon is uh, definitely, um, you, you will be able to. You will definitely be able to go six months because you're able to go back to your gradual activity after six weeks of C-section. So for six months, maybe you can start with uh, maybe a 5km, you know, nothing too uh, much I would say, but... You see, there we go. I think the female athlete is definitely a lot stronger than this older male athlete. And I would be quite happy to take that as, as, as advice. <laughs> okay, here we go for the I'll next poll. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The next poll question. Hey. Yep. Yeah. Lactation as well. Yeah, now it's about lactation. Does exercise, uh, we can say intense exercise, affects lactation after birth? Certainly. Yes or no? Again, Malini, I, you are the answerable. I'm not going to ask Andrew this now. Yeah. So, <laughs> I have yeah, no experience good. in this. Okay, five more seconds to publish the results. Flash poll. Yeah, yeah, we're getting more results. Yes. Okay, here we go, the results. Yes. Yes. So again, <laughs> this is not very optimistic. Yeah, it's, uh, again, uh, it's a deeper subject, I know. So, Marani, do you have to say more about this? Uh, yes, uh, because uh, what happens is, um, uh, it, is um, it has been uh, said that when you are lactating, and it's always to not to do any kind of vigorous exercise, because 
not only it will sort of like um, reduce your um, uh, lactation, but it also can lead to breast infection because of uh, uh, what happens is, let, let's say, for example, uh, 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 if you were to be uh, taking part in the sports, uh, you might even have like um, uh, nipple, uh, nipple laceration. Uh, you know, if you're not wearing the proper sports bra, you're not wearing the, the proper clothing, there'll be friction. And especially for someone who's uh, lactating, uh, the, the nipples are very sore. They're very, uh, uh, you know, so if uh, that's why we advise them to do to start to start with low impact or very uh, moderate exercises compared to a very vigorous exercises. And uh, in regards of your lactation, uh, it definitely will sort of like reduce it, uh, but not in an extent where you have complete no um, breast milk supply. Uh, but in given view, uh, you can still uh, take part in a, a low impact activity, I would say. Okay, yeah. great. So here we go for the next poll, the last poll. Yeah. So what do you think? Exercise delays puberty in girls. One of the commonest things in India back here is we have early puberty as a problem. Delayed puberty with exercise, maybe intense exercise or sports activity. Uh, we got fast responses now. Wait for a couple of seconds more to publish. Yes. And here are the results. So more in favor of yes. delay. Again, no Andrew, again Malni. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um it, it, it does to a certain extent as we're talking about like the delay uh, the de uh, delay development of uh, breast development all right uh, but uh, even menstrual cycle sometimes it gets delayed um, by right even nowadays there are girls who are getting their period as early as um, uh, 9 10 and some gets delayed especially when you're 15 16 years old but uh, uh, given that it's it's still advisable to do exercise as well because uh, it, it sort of give confidence for the adolescents, for teenagers to get a uh, confidence of their body, uh, to feel good about themselves. Uh, but like I said, uh, everything has to be in moderation. Uh, when you increase too much of your activity, uh, the hormones in a female, your progesterone and estrogen, as well as your in a male counterparts, your androgens and testosterone, it sort of gets uh, off tone. It sort of get um, off balanced. So everything has to be in moderation. But uh, just do, do, don't completely cease any kind of activity because the benefits of exercise is um, uh, sort of like more compared to the, 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 the cons of it. Okay, thank you, Dr. Marley. That's for me. Another thing I want to add on if there is a delay in the puberty because of exercise, sometimes you have to think of the female athlete triads are the children, child taking proper nutrition, are they if any eating disorder is the bone mineral density is okay. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Alson. Very valid point. So Andrew and Professor Mahin, can we move on to the next session? Thanks, yes. Dr. Mahin. Certainly. Thank you very much, Dr. Malini. Thank you very much for the valuable inputs and for all the questions. So we come to our last uh, presenter for this afternoon um, with Dr. Ang Yong. Um, Dr. Ang Yong Geek, sorry, Dr. Ang Geek Yong is a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Sports Science and Recreation. Um, her specialization includes, but is not limited to applications of next generation sequencing, uh, sports genomics, molecular genetics, and development of biosensors and rapid diagnostic tests. Uh, I, I'm personally looking very forward to this. It's an interest of mine. Um, and Dr. Ang, if you can join us, please turn your screen on so we can all see you. Uh, and we look forward to your presentation. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for the kind and warm introduction. So today, I would like to give a brief overview about the concept of genetic entrainability. 
So our human genome is encoded as DNA within 23 pairs of chromosome. And the building blocks of DNA are actually nucleotides with one of the four bases, which are adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. So the size of the human genome is actually 3.3 billion bases. And the first human genome actually took 13 years to sequence and complete. So interestingly, less than 2% of the human genome are actually protein encoding genes. So variations that happen in a particular gene can give rise to different alleles. And the set of alleles that a person has is actually known as the genotype. So different genotype can actually give rise to different types of phenotypes. The central dogma of molecular biology actually states that DNA makes RNA makes protein. So RNA are actually transcribed from DNA and proteins are translated from RNA. So protein have many critical roles in the body. And this includes regulation, such as transcription factor, signaling, such as receptor, transport, such as hemoglobin, in structure, such as collagen, those proteins that are involved in the catalysis of multiple chemical reactions, such as enzyme, as well as structural proteins that are crucial for movement, such as actin and myosin. So in the following slides, I would like to give an example of some genetic variations that can be found in an enzyme, as well as a structural protein that is involved in movement. So the angiotensin converting enzyme plays an essential role in two physiological systems. The first system being the renin angiotensin system, whereby the angiotensin converting enzymes convert the inactive angiotensin 1 into a potent vasoconstrictor growth promoting angiotensin 2. And secondly, in the kinin calacrine system, whereby the enzymes actually degrade a strong vasodilator growth inhibiting bradykinin into an inactive bradykinin. So this angiotensin converting enzyme is encoded by the ACE gene. And this gene is located in chromosome 17 and it has a length of 21 kilobases. In this gene, there is an indel located in intron 16. And this indel actually consists of a 270, 287 base pair ALU element that is either inserted or deleted at this particular position. So the D allele or the deletion allele is actually associated with greater plasma as well as tissue, angiotensin converting enzyme levels and activity. So previous studies involving military, military recruits have shown that carriers of the DD genotype actually showed greater left ventricular mass gain after 10 weeks of physical training. So this DLU is associated with greater mu muscle volume as well as a higher proportion of fast twitch or type two muscle fiber. And this LU is usually found to be overrepresented in strength and power athlete. So on the contrary, the insertion or ILU is associated with lower enzyme levels as well as activity, but it is associated with greater proportion of slow twitch or type one muscle fiber. Generally, the ILU is associated with endurance performance and it has been found to be overrepresented in elite mountaineers, as well as distant runners and rovers. Next, I would like to talk about the alpha actinine tree. So alpha actinine tree is a bi actin binding protein that is found in the ZDs of the sarcomere. So, more importantly, the alpha actinine tree is only found in fast twitch or type 2 muscle fiber. Therefore, this protein is very important to stabilize the contractile apparatus 
in the muscle fiber that is responsible for generating force at high velocity. The alpha actinin 3 protein is encoded by the ACTN3 gene. And this gene is located in chromosome 11 and has a length of 11.4 kilobases. The substitution of the C nucleotide to the T nucleotide in exon 16 actually results in the substitution of arginine at position 577 into a premature stock codon. So the C allele is actually a functional allele and this allele is associated with increased cross-sectional area of the muscle as well as higher proportion of fast twitch muscle fiber. Therefore, you can see that why this particular allele tends to be overrepresented in strength and sprint athletes. On the other hand, the T allele is actually known as a null allele because the nonsense mutation actually results in no functional alpha actinine 3 being expressed. So this particular allele is associated with greater proportion of slow twitch muscle fiber and tend to be overrepresented in endurance-oriented athletes. So in order to estimate the heritability of exercise-related traits, twin studies are usually conducted whereby monozygotic twins who are genetically identical, as well as dizygotic twins who share 50% of their DNA sequence variations are recruited. So after recruitment, the desired exercise related traits, it could be uh, aerobic capacity as well as strength, including trainability of these traits. They are measured and then the correlation coefficient is calculated for the monozygotic twin as well as the dizygotic twin pair. So if a particular trait is heritable, the trait should be better correlated, meaning that the correlation coefficient should be higher among monozygous twin pair because these twin pair are genetically identical as compared to the dizygous twin pair. If a heritable trait has been estimated to be 40%, the remaining 60% will actually be attributed to environmental variability such as training and nutrition as well as measurement error. So the endurance performance depends on a lot of uh, limiting factors such as VO2 max, percentage of VO2 max at lactic threshold, as well as mechanical efficiency. And these factors in turn are influenced by environmental factors, which includes training and nutrition, as well as DNA sequence variation. So this DNA sequence variation can be in the form of common alleles. It means that the allele is present at higher than 1% frequency in a particular population, such as the ACE, I, and D polymorphism that I have shared earlier. Or it could be also due to rare allele, such as the erythropoietin receptor mutation that can result in polycythemia. And this particular mutation is famously carried by Ero Mantiranta, who is one of the most successful Finnish cross-country skier and a triple Olympic medallion. So key endurance limiting factors, including VO2 max, VO2 max trainability, and fiber type proportion have been estimated to be approximately 50% inherited. So a similar scenario can also be observed in terms of muscle strength and mass. So strength depends on limiting factors such as muscle mass and neuromuscular activation. And these are also influenced by environmental as well as DNA sequence variation. So common alleles such as the ACTN3, C allele that I have presented earlier have been shown to be associated with strength. But there are also rare alleles that can confer strength. Uh, one of the most uh, famous examples would be in the case of a toddler, whereby a mutation in the myostatin gene 
resulted in this toddler exhibiting pronounced uh, skeletal muscle hypertrophy way beyond his peer. So twin studies result has actually shown that heritability of static, dynamic and explosive strength vary widely. But at the same time, it also indicates that this trait can be significantly inherited. So in a review article that was published in 2015, we can see that the cumulative number of spots related DNA polymorphism has steadily increased from 1997 to 2014. So there are at least 120 genetic markers that are linked to elite athlete status. And out of this 120, 77 are endurance related, 43 are power and strength related. However, there is an indication whereby there is lack of replication studies, whereby only 11 of these genetic markers have shown positive association with athlete status in three or more studies. So here is a snapshot uh, of the genetic markers that have been compi uh, compiled and tabulated by the authors. So in this particular uh, table, you can actually see the list of genes as well as the marker that is related to either endurance or power and strength, as well as the number of studies that have shown positive association or negative or controversial results as well as the number of athletes that has been recruited for this study. So it is clear to see that from this table, the ACE and ACT entry genetic polymorphism remains the most widely investigated spots related uh, genetic polymorphism. So how does one actually detect genetic variation in a laboratory setting? So one of the conventional and relatively low cost method would be through allele specific polymerase chain reaction. So this particular technique specifically amplify your desired or targeted genetic variation. The drawback of this method is that usually the assay is designed to detect only one marker at a time. So studies has actually moved on to use more advanced technology, which includes microarray, whereby more genetic markers can be detected simultaneously. So you can harvest more data by using microarray instead of PCR. However, the technology now that can be used to actually sequence the whole genome is known as the next generation sequencing. So the first human genome actually to 13 years to sequence and complete. However, using NGS technology now, the whole genome of an individual can actually be sequenced in less than seven days. So advancement in the sequencing technology has led to the growth of population skill genome research. So in this ensemble website, one can actually look at the differences in the allele frequency across five superpopulation. So these five superpopulations, uh, namely African, American, East Asian, European, and South Asian. So in this case of the ACT entry, uh, C and T allele, we can see that the functional C allele is the highest in African superpopulation and the lowest in South Asian. And if one is actually interested to look into all the subpopulation, the allele frequency as well as the genotype frequency, you may actually find those data in this website. And this actually belongs to a public domain and is freely accessible. So last but not least, the recent um, publication into the potential of personalizing or tailoring training performance based on genetic profile has actually prompted uh, our research team to conduct an exploratory study into this area. So what we have done is that we have actually recruited 20 UITM football club players 
to participate in eight weeks high intensity resistance training. And what we have found that the group that carry more strength and power alleles responded better to high intensity training as compared to those with the less amount of power or strength related allele. So the group that has more of this power or strength related alleles actually showed a mean improvement of 15.4% in vertical jumping performance. Whereas the comparison group only showed a mean improvement of 2.8%. So indeed, definitely more research is needed in this area because when it comes to genetic, there are many factors, including differences in uh, population, as well as um, I haven't even touched about, for example, gene environment interaction, epigenetics influence. So genetic is not, a, a, how to say, something that one can rely 100% on to predict talent. So that is not the purpose of genetic. But what I can see is that genetic has the potential to actually improve training outcome. So it is actually associated with the physiological aspect of training. So with that, I would like to end my seventh session for today. So thank you very much for your time and kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Ang. If you don't mind just staying on with your camera, uh, if you don't mind stopping sharing your screen, um, and then we will get the questions up for you. I certainly think, though, just as somebody that's involved in training elite athletes, we know that this might not be sort of the, the silver lining, uh, and it may not account for 100% of people's performance, but I certainly think what you've mentioned here will provide us with at least a 1% or 2% improvement. Um, and very often, as the higher we go in athletics and, and in terms of sport, if we can offer us our athletes one or two percentage more, I think that sometimes can be the difference between winning and losing games and winning and losing an event. So, yeah, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, great. So just quickly, just two questions. Um, what are the role of genetics and exercise prescription for elite athletes? Um, I know you, you said that there's lots of research to do, but is there anything that you can give us from some, some of the studies or some of the research you've been involved in? Okay, so for us, we have actually started to work in this area uh, with our UITM FC footballers. But to answer this particular question, uh, I would like to answer it on a, more, a broader or generous sense. So one of the difficulties in sports genomic research is actually in the recruitment of athletes. So most of the studies that have found uh, positive associations or uh, who have generated finding tends to be untrained subject. So this type of subject usually they will be, um, uh, they would actually give higher commitment or compliance to undergo a particular set of training. Because as we know, elite athletes, uh, as well as their coaches, I believe that they would not like it if, uh, if we were to go and approach, could you please change your training program into this particular program that we have designed to test and see whether it will be actually helpful for you. So that is one of the issues that is faced in uh, sports genomic studies. Uh, there is a lack of studies involving elite athletes. So there are more studies involving untrained uh, athletes in terms of exercise prescription. But for the athlete status, so yes, they do try to recruit elite athletes as well as control non-athletes to compare and see if certain alleles tends to be overrepresented in this group of elite status. Great. And just the second question here is just the role of the environment. Um, can, you, can you touch on what the role of an environment is um, and how that potentially will influence the gene expression? All right. Uh, so like I have mentioned previously, one of the way to actually uh, gauge or estimate environmental factor will be through the twin studies. So because uh, monozygotic twins have uh, genetically identical genome sequences, so when we compare that to the dizygous twins, 
So the variation between them will be attributed to environmental factor. But for those who are interested to know how environmental factor actually uh, affect, I think that one of the key terms could be epigenetic. So when it comes to epigenetic, our DNA sequence um, is still the same, but then some genes tend to be switched on and off. So the switching on and off of our gene is actually referring to epigenetic. And epigenetic or modification uh, of this switching on and off can be influenced by, for example, diet as well as training. So you can see that how uh, certain genes become more accessible for transcription or less accessible for transcription can be so easily modified just mm. through diet or training. So, yeah. So the environment definitely does play a role somehow. Somehow. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your time, uh, all four speakers. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Tiaka Rajan um, from Chennai right now. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks, Ang, for the wonderful lecture. So here comes your friendly neighborhood polling officer. We are back with some short three polls for you also. So the first poll question is about various methods of choosing sport. Is it by the interest of a child or should it be based on anthropometry or based on genetics? I know it's a combination of all factors, but among these three factors, which is, seems to be more important for choosing a sport. I would like to suggest that we have a conference to answer those three, that, that question in itself. <laughs> I know, it's a, such a broad topic, but since these questions are to just open up the mind and start debates. So here we go. In a few seconds, we'll release the results of this poll. Great. So here's the result. So more than science, the passion seems to be more important as per the panel here present. And uh, this is, of course, debatable. So let's move on to the next poll question. So this again, based on genetics. And the question is about even more broader question. Are athletes born or made? Or what? is it for different sports? A, B, or C? I don't see yet an answer for response or born. B and C are scoring. Now I agree with Andrew. We should have a conference for this itself <laughs> to discuss. Maybe next webinar will be only based on polls and then the panel will discuss. We'll have a new webinar. Like yeah. we said, it can be a webinar. Yeah. <laughs> we may have to have about five conferences to deal with the topics that have been raised. Okay. <laughs> so the answer to the results to the second poll, yes. It differs from different sports. I think that's more logical and no one has opted for athletes or born. So no. that's some um, consolation for everyone. Like we can yeah. be, we perform better. Tomorrow we start. <laughs> if I may, I would actually like to add that uh, in the US, they have an act called Genetic Information Discriminatory Act, non-discriminatory act, sorry, Dina. So, uh, coaches or even any sort of party, they are not supposed to discriminate anyone based on their genetic. We know that there are a lot of commercial genetic test kits being offered as of now. So through this act, none of the coaches are supposed to say that just because you do not have the ACE, uh, I allele or the ACTN 3C allele, therefore you are not qualified to join the team. So they are not supposed to do that because they are, they are genetic information as is being safeguarded by this uh, Gina. And then mm. when it comes to elite athlete, it is said that the ones that who could achieve to the very peak of their performance requires both aspects, uh, genetic as well as uh, training. Because through genetics, they are already having that particular foundation to respond more favorably 
to their training. So that is why, yes, um, genetics do contribute to sports performance, but it does appear that the ones who actually reach the peak uh, do benefit from the benefits uh, or advantage being conferred by their genetic makeup. Uh, excellent, excellent point, Dr. Anna, because of the mushrooming of this commercial genetics uh, uh, report providers, we have a lot of uh, uh, myths and uh, somebody should not get branded like you are this, you are that, because genetic result is just like a clinical investigation. So it has to be compared and uh, uh, considered along with the other factors. And uh, here we go for the last poll in continuation with this topic. So should the genetic screening be made part of the standard athlete selection process? Should it be made? I think Dr. Ang already answered it earlier <laughs> before the poll coming in. Mm. So yes or no, or mm -hmm. only in selected sports, the wow. genetic screening as a standard selection process as a pre-competition assessment or the basic athletic assessment. Great. We have fast responses here. Almost 80% have voted. So let us close the poll and release the result here. 50-50. Yeah. <laughs> Very few yes answers and uh, no is 50%. And uh, that shows how gray the genetics area is. And uh, Dr. Ang, if you have some comments on this, we'll close the session with this. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I do recall reading in the uh, Stars newspaper, it's a, it's a local publication here in Malaysia. So I've read that China is actually doing a mass screening for, um, for their Olympics athlete, Winter Olympics 2022, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, so that was in the public domain and there are countries that are admitting that they are uh, utilizing this genetic screening as one of their tools or measure. But I think that what is most important is the awareness and understanding of the extent of um, the contribution of these uh, genetic markers and the strength of the evidence that has been collected to date. So if the coaches understand that this should not be a straight cut off rule between yes, you should join, no, you shouldn't join the team. So if they are able to harness this information and complement it with their existing uh, assessment tool, so that will make their judgment more objective instead of subjective. Uh, yeah, that, that's my final comment. Thank you, Ranta. Thank you so much for the okay. very wonderful presentation. So over to Professor Mahin and Andrew for their closing comments. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Rahman. I, I think it, we have done a very good uh, presentation from the altitude up to the genetic molecular <laughs> level. I think uh, Ang uh, for nailed it up and uh, Prof. And don't forget, don't forget the women, physical activity. Yeah, I'm going to come there, <laughs> come to that. She controlled the whole country and she put all women, 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 all oh, healthcare women, everything women, <laughs> men's are out. <laughs> We have to do more work and we have to more support the ladies. I, I guess uh, she put it very nice point and views on the ladies. And uh, uh, for Austin, he have put the uh, impact of physical activity on the COVID. Look at him. He already changed his attire. He's already going to go for his uh, training already. <laughs> he's, ready. he's ready for his training. So I, I think it's a very good uh, way of understanding us from the basic sciences to applied sciences and we see how it's feasible and helpful for the scientists as well as the medical practitioner, how is things can work about. I think they have put, put all the uh, impact uh, exercise, how important is it? I, I think I'll pass over to Andrew. Andrew, you have anything to say? Yeah, you know, I often I think that in t times like this, when we go through these webinars and we get information, to me, it's it's wonderful to get down to the theoretical and the science and the research behind it, because there's so many ways of of interpreting and influencing things. And I think the four presenters today have produced research, which we wouldn't normally get held. Certainly somebody in my environment doesn't normally get access to. And that promotes for me, it prompts questions, it prompts um different types of thinking processes. So I want to, I, I'm, I'm excited about what I've heard today, what I've learned today. And 
and what's coming up in the next couple of weeks on, on these seminars, because I think just the research that you guys have presented, now everybody that's listening has the ability to go and use it and adapt it into their own environments. And that's important for me. Um, I don't get access to the research as much as obviously these presenters have. So I want to take the, take the information and I want to be able to apply it. And that to me is, is, is great. So thank you to the, all four of you um, right across the board from the various topics I've learned today. Um, and I'm certainly going to go out and start practicing and start researching, doing some, doing some literature research on my own. So thank you very much to all of you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, great. So on behalf of the Indian and Malaysian Associations of Sports Medicine and the Asian Federation of Sports Medicine, we thank all the speakers, all the participants, and all the organizers mm -hmm. for this wonderful... Okay, take a few uh, seconds to promote and, the... Uh, we look forward to meet you next. And I would like to request Professor Mahin to talk about this event, which is coming up by oh. MS. Okay, uh, I think let the secretary to talk. Dr. Austin, you can talk about it. <laughs> okay, uh, on behalf of Malaysian Associations of Sport Medicines, uh, we welcome everyone to join us uh, next year, uh, which is on 15 to 16 June 2021 in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, for the International Sport Medicines and Exercise Science Conference and also our uh, Malaysian Association of Sport Medicine Biannual General Meeting. Um, pre, uh, for the past few years, we have uh, successfully organized the first and the second Asian Sport Medicine Conference. And uh, this conference will be a very good platform for knowledge exchange and also for networking, uh, especially for all those uh, doctors, uh, sport uh, physiotherapists, rehabilitators, sport scientists and uh, sport trainer or, or even athletes that uh, have uh, interest and have uh, want to learn more about uh, the latest up to date mm -hmm. in uh, sport medicine and exercise science. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Alston, and thank you, Professor Mahin. I thought uh, Dr. Alston already started running. So, <laughs> okay. Great. So, see you all tomorrow, or uh, not tomorrow, next week, uh, Thursday, Friday, okay. for the next series of exciting webinars. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Ah. Started sharing. Okay. Where is the leave button? See you all. Thank you. Bye.